Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum for the uh, week of April 2nd, which is when this is being filmed. Uh, we're in the beautiful Memorial Arena in Victoria, BC, and our first guest is Will Smith. And we're going to be talking about, just very briefly, about something that happened this past week of great importance and the way the public still doesn't know much about it, but Will's going to tell us. Thanks, Jack. Well, the last time we were speaking on the show, um, I ended up with defusing fear. I, wanted, I want people to uh, realize that, that we don't need to fear anything. There's a lot, we're being sold a lot of fear. And something came up this last week. I read through the Canadian 2013 budget and realized that it looked like one of the things that was possible with the big banks is the same type of thing that happened in Cyprus where the government and the banks just decide to take people's money. And the wording was such that it was not understood as that. They, they simply uh, talked about uh, that the depositors would become uh, equity partners. I didn't even mention uh, the depositors. But at any rate, I was concerned enough about it to do some reading. And I wouldn't even mention it except for the fact that basically the same thing has been said by the Bank of England, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the United States, uh, the finance minister of Europe, of the Eurozone, uh, Dieselboom, said that, it was a that what was happening in Cyprus was a template for the rest of the Eurozone. And then in Australia and New Zealand too, so there's something up. And basically what it looks like is that in s your demand deposits would be able to be used for something else besides deposits. In other words, you wouldn't be able to withdraw them. So, so your money that's in a Canadian bank, will they'll be able to do what they're doing in Cyprus, which exactly. is to some extent take it. Expropriate it, right. Yeah. And so when we were at the Capitol on Sunday at the HST, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, Bill van der Zand was there and I ought to just go ask him. And so I did. And he's, he's very interested, shall we say, in the, in this, uh, the possibility too. And, We'll show you that clip. But to me, this whole thing is like is something like having a, an uncle who's got a gambling problem or a, or a drinking problem or something, and everybody says, well, you know, we got to get through this. Just, just give him another bunch of money to, so he can gamble a little more or give him, a little, give him another bottle of booze because so, we got to keep everything going. So that's to me what it's saying. And, but there are other alternatives, so I, I just want to go... Uh, I want to keep going on that vein and it, perhaps in another show and we're we'll, going to watch this clip too. Are you aware of the uh, bail-in provisions in the new 2013 federal budget? Can you believe it? Cyprus? Are you, are you aware of that? I'm aware of it. Do you have any, could you, could you make a quick comment? Well, I'm, I, I'm surprised that we haven't heard more about this through the media, but uh, it's being downplayed too much, but I'm, uh, I'm thinking it will come up much more over the next several weeks because it's, it's so anti-democratic, it's so unbelievable. You wouldn't think this could happen in Canada, but it, apparently it's in the legislation on page 144 and 145. Yep. Yeah, Thank you I very heard much. that too. Do you, do you call that money grab in Cyprus? Of course, that's a money. Well, it's in Cyprus. It's a money grab. Mm -hmm. If you've saved your money, it's in the bank, and some government comes along and says we want a part of it now, even though you paid income tax on it. That's a money grab. Welcome back to Citizens Forum, April second. Uh, this part of the show is the Walter and Jack show, where we try to talk about some of the issues of the day from a non-corporate point of view. Um, last week, Walter, you mentioned I had shown a, a, a headline talking about how difficult it was for young people to get jobs and make money and get their lives going these days, just how tough it is in so many ways. And you said that, well, you know, young people and all of us really should get involved more in politics. And I, I want to just go from there because I, I, I say not we've got to change politics. We've got, I think what we have to get involved in is creating democracy. And the political parties are simply not there. I mean, I'm a member of the NDP. I'm sure the other parties are exactly the same. You get never-ending requests for money and they never want to hear really what you think or what you want or that doesn't matter. 
they want to get elected and because the corporations own the media and the media basically controls who's going to get elected, the political parties have to do what they want. They can't do what we want. And we citizens have got to change that around. So if you want to get elect if you want to get involved politically, I'd say the most important thing is getting involved in building independent media and distribution is an important part of that. Maybe we all can't be uh, putting out a newspaper, but we can certainly help distribute and we can donate money because the infrastructure for independent media exists through every town and every city right across this country. All it needs is a bit of money to get going because these are people who do it on shoestring budgets and usually do great work. But they just need the money to make it happen and we can all contribute to that. Yeah, you know, I've been attached to political parties in the past and worked with political parties and tried to make change and and uh, you know the thing is as you pointed out the parties just are not showing the way forward now the leaders of the parties are way too powerful they're really dictating to for instance Adrian uh, Dix who's likely to become the next premier uh, him and a, a, a few close associates are pretty well going to set the agenda uh, and we'll have another dictatorship of sorts for another four years or so. And I think the other thing is, uh, it just comes to mind is that um, what motivates me are issues. You know, uh, attach yourself to issues and, 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 and act like you care, like really try to make change with issues. And also realizing that there's a political component to the to okay. change. So I'm going to go from there because I've been fighting on issues in BC for I'd say 20 more than 25 years now and I think what we're doing when we fight the issues and they're important and we have to fight them and we have to do all of that but what we're dealing with there is the symptoms. The real root problem and where we have to go is that we don't have democracy. I mean, most of us wanted to save our forests 25 years ago, which was, I, I know, because polling was done by the governments. They knew what people wanted. And what people wanted was a lot of protection for the environment. But, but that never happened. It didn't matter one bit because the corporations own the media and the corporations own the politicians. So we, the citizens, are largely irrelevant. And I really think all of us have got to put some focus onto those issues. We've got to build the media that can tell us what's Correct. going on, and we've got to create a political system, a governmental, sis a governmental system that's democratic, which simply means that what we want, we the people, is what starts to happen. Well, for instance, I mean, you, you should have free votes in the legislature. You shouldn't be tied to, to the leader almost on every vote. Now, that's an issue, Jack. Yeah, what I'm saying is like it's not just uh, the aspects of uh, what's happening in your society, but actually looking at governance models and and uh, supporting more open governance, more uh, uh, consultation with the public, uh, uh, more long vision sort of in decision making. But, but underlying all of that, informing the public honestly, finding out what the citizens want, and then doing it. That's what our government should be doing. But over and over and over again, they're not because they don't work for us. We've lost control, and the corporations have taken control. Yeah, and you know, I, I always just feel like I'm being managed. And, and when I listen to these leaders talk, I just feel like, oh, uh, there they go. They've, they've consulted with the, the public relations department, and now they're mouthing these words, and there's, they're not genuine at all. So uh, this week, the HST is now gone. We've gone back to the, uh, the combination PST and GST. Uh, I went to one of my favorite restaurants. Let's say I go there four times a week. The breakfast I used to have that cost eight forty now costs seven ninety. So that's fifty cents, right? For that less tax on that breakfast. I go there four times a week. That's two dollars. Over a year, that's $104 that I was paying in extra tax, right, because of the HST, just on coffee and a sandwich. Yeah. The average person in BC was spending about $450 a year on the HST. A family of four, that's $1,800. Yeah. 
And the government was not getting more money because of this, because essentially what happened was, as we paid more on the HST, corporate big business got the break, and they paid less. The government really maybe gets a little bit more, but not much. It was a tax shift. And it just infuriates me watching the media report on this, and they never make an issue of that, to me, most important point. The process was terrible, totally undemocratic. But why do we have that tax? Because we were paying more and business was paying less. One more example of our... Another example of it, you know, and I mean, I haven't been watching the, the corporate media that carefully in the last week or so, but the impression I was getting from the few clips I saw was it was a bit of a mixed message. There's going to be a bit of a problem. It's going to be complicated going back to the old system. Uh, you know, uh, there's just uh, no, no real sense of a celebration because, to me, yeah. it should be a huge celebration, not only to get rid of an awful tax, but the fact that the public rose up and fought against their politicians, fought against the bureaucracy and the corporate media, the public rose up and won. Walter, I never even thought of that, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. It should be a celebration, yeah. and they've turned it into a nitpicking this, that, and the other. Well, it's a historical event. It's yes. never happened in Canada before. And I mean, I uh, think we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Bill van der Zam, our good buddy Bill van der Zam, for because he really did head this, this whole initiative. And also, they had around 6,000 volunteers to pull this off. It's a fantastic thing that they did, and, and uh, I think we should all be very proud, and hopefully we can do it again. That's what I'm saying. We can use the same Recall Initiative Act again to do other things. You are absolutely right. It's a celebration. Congratu congratulations to all of us. That's right. For having done this really wonderful thing. But I will say, if they had another two weeks, it would have lost because in the end it only won by a small amount because we were getting so much misinformation, so much propaganda, so much advertising from business and the government about what a big mistake we were making. Yeah. But why? Because we're paying more tax and business is paying less tax. Well, their tax. budget was, was 10 times was all higher about. than the, the people that were, that were against the HST. I heard 20. They were outspending it, it us was ridiculous. 20 to 1. Uh, yeah. How much money was being thrown around to to not let it happen. You have a small business. Was it difficult to do the big changeover back to the PST GST? It's no issue whatsoever. I still have my old invoices with the, with the PST GST. I mean, it's not complicated. And, uh, you know, in renovations and in building construction, a lot of cases you don't have to charge the uh, HST and uh, or the GST. So you're, you're going to have a tax break for people that are doing that sort of work. So that's that's good for good for the construction industry in general. And I think we're going to see uh, it'll help us climb out of the doldrums. Okay, next topic is Monsanto and North Korea. So I mentioned that to you <laughs> earlier when we were having coffee and you said, what's that all about? Well, so this is April the 2nd. This is being filmed. The big story for the last week has been North Korea. You know, they're out of control, crazy leadership, attacking the United States. Well, I mean, that's what the media is telling us. I stopped believing anything the media told me quite a long time ago, for the most part. Um, is this true? I don't know. But I know there's another big story that got zero coverage in the corporate media, and they always do that. They pick one story that they build way out of proportion to reality and use that to cover up what's the real story. Oh, yes. And the yeah. real story is that a law was just passed uh, in the United States. I believe it was signed into law by President Obama, the great winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, um, today or yesterday, or it's going to be signed tomorrow, I don't know what. And I, I'm not sure even what it says, but I think it puts Monsanto in the United States and all of Monsanto's genetically contaminated foods, which are dangerous to all of us, it puts them kind of above the law. I mean, so the Congress has voted to change the laws so that Monsanto can now, we can't go after it, we can't stop them. They, they are, and not a word, not a word. So. 
And the media does that to us all the time, you know. You know, Monsanto had the gall to sue uh, that town in Quebec, uh, Hudson, Quebec, to try to force them to use uh, pesticides on their boulevards and such. I don't know if that was Monsanto. That was the chemical industry. Uh, well, the well chemical Monsanto was, was one of them. That's oh, right. yeah, they were the plaintiffs. Right. Monsanto versus uh, Hudson, Quebec, and they lost. That's right. So. Uh, these guys don't always win every time. In, in the United States, we do have a situation where uh, uh, the Monsanto is a huge lobby, and, and they do have incredible power in Washington. And as you can see, they actually passed a, passed a law in Washington, probably the only one that was passed the last year, because they can't do anything else. Well, you know, they keep telling us that the government can't do anything, but when it comes <laughs> to passing a law like this, it happens. Yeah. It happens very, very quickly and very, very easily yeah. without anybody ever hearing about it. So the government is still functioning. It's just not working for us. <laughs> it's, it's working for Monsanto and the rest of them. And Obama has, made, Obama has made top executives and consultants and lawyers from Monsanto. They're throughout the health and safety and, and environmental uh, agencies of the U.S. government. He and previous presidents have just put them there. It's, I mean, the U.S. government is completely corrupt, and the U.S. has become, I mean, is it the biggest terrorist nation in the world now with, with what they're doing in, in, what they did in Iraq, what they're doing in Syria, what they did in Libya, what, everywhere. It's, it's just crazy. Yeah. Sewage treatment. Um, the chair of the CRD sewage treatment was on the radio a little while ago, there's been this huge uproar in Victoria about the decision to build a sludge treatment plant in Esquimalt, all the negotiations done in complete secrecy, and the chair of the uh, committee said, well, we're going to have an open house to let people you know, see what's going on. And I just wanted to say that the reason that the government and the corporations always have open houses now is because that is the kind of public meeting that is the most easy for them to control. Yeah. We are voiceless and powerless in an open yeah. house. They run it and they file us through. We don't get to hear anything from anybody else except their paid staff. And it's disgraceful. You know, if you had a public forum where people go to the mics and they speak their mind and they ask a question, which is a fairly, rarely fair way to do things. Kind of a town hall meeting. Yes, where you have an interaction, ideas are exchanged. And um, yeah, I went to the recent Enbridge Pipeline open house and it was just odd and strange. A whole lot of PR flack standing around, mouthing the same words, living in, just living in, not in reality. Uh, and a whole lot of disgruntled people milling about not being able to really engage. Yeah. So uh, that's what we're dealing so with. So I think we should all be telling the politicians, stop having these public processes that work for you so you can manage us and you can say you've had a public process because that's what it's all about. They can say they had a public process. Yeah. Start doing something that works for us citizens. Ask us what we want. I would say more town hall meeting where different points of view are expressed and people can show what they think, not these, these undemocratic town hall meet or open houses that, that they control. It's, it's a disgrace. Why do our politicians do this to us? 599% um, interest. I just want to That's a good deal. Yeah. Once again, I've, I've talked about this a bit before. Um, Money Mart, I mean, these, these Payday loan places are growing in number. Money Mart charges an annual interest rate of 599%. It's, a, it's an absolute disgrace because it's the working poor who go there. Why does our society allow it to happen? Well, you know, Jack, I thought about it. And, and really, the corporate banking system, uh, they just are not uh, able to, to accommodate uh, low-income people to set up bank accounts with them and everything like that. They charge too much for it. Now this would be something that would be a really great thing to do for a progressive provincial government to do to actually set up as uh, like a, a savings uh, credit union 
that will allow these very low income people to set up accounts for free or for very little and to be able to cash their checks and also basically the money marts of the world really shouldn't exist they they are basically it's a it's a, a predatorial business uh, and preying on desperate people and it shouldn't they should not exist as simple as that in my view so I guess it's probably somewhere between the provincial government and the federal government would have to bring in a few rules and laws but basically just set up a system that does what those payday loan companies do well you just that just does it for cheap yeah you just ma you just make it a law that the banks would have to accept yeah. low income savings accounts and, and uh, checking accounts and that uh, they have to charge very very little oh, by the way the banks are doing okay you know they could afford to do this just simply create some legislation and force them to do it that's sim that's the simplest way to do it yeah um, we're out of time one minute left um, I think you know the underlying issue to me is a better democracy which just means that what the public wants becomes more important in the general scope of things and that I, I really think there's nothing that could happen in this country that would take us in better directions than just a bit more democracy and one other thing I really I think is very important that never gets a mention is the fact that a, a society in which income is more equally allocated is a society that's usually the most successful in the world. You just have to look at the world's countries. The most successful societies are those where income is equal. Our leadership, both business and government, is moving us in exactly the wrong direction. And we have to stop them. If we had more democracy, we would. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum, the Walter and Jack Show.